So if it was a terror attack, was it inspired or ordered? CBS News senior national security analyst Juan Zarate is in our Washington Bureau. Juan, good morning. Good morning, Anthony. We, we heard Juliana Goldman say that, that Islamic State Radio said um, this morning that, that uh, the two killers were followers. Uh, how much credibility do we give to that claim? Well, I think they're being very careful about the language that, that they use, and they're using the language of supporters and now martyrs. And so that suggests that ISIS uh, is recognizing that these two were perhaps inspired by their message, uh, but perhaps not deployed or directed. Uh, and that's an important distinction. Uh, we know that ISIS has uh, claimed attacks in the past. There has been great credibility to what they have claimed. Uh, and even when there has been uh, some doubt about whether or not there has been truth to what they're uh, uh, laying claim to, for example, the Sinai attacks, uh, eventually uh, it has uh, become uh, more and more evident that they have been responsible. So I think we do have to listen to what ISIS says. And in fact, they're t calling uh, these individuals supporters, uh, which, is, uh, which is very indicative of the role that they played. It seems like the other level to this story is that it's a 27-year-old woman who's involved with a six-month-old child. Do you think there's a chance she might have been the one that radicalized her husband? It could be. And I think one of the trends that we've been seeing over the past couple of years is the growing role of women, uh, not just in the Islamic State, but in terrorist groups writ large. The Islamic State has been purposely trying to recruit women, uh, not just women as support members in, in the organization, but actually as operational members of the group. And so uh, this is not altogether surprising that a woman would be involved. And it comes right on the heels of women being involved in the Paris attacks as well. So not altogether surprising. But what, what is particularly uh, disturbing here, Juan, I think it, it, this is a woman with a six-month-old child. There, there was no indication in the community uh, of, of, of them leaning in this direction. I mean, this is, I mean, that makes this particularly frightening in, in many ways. No, I think you're right. And I think it points to the fact that radicalization can happen in any context and certainly can happen quickly, um, sometimes outside the gaze of family and friends, and certainly in this case, outside the gaze of law enforcement. These are two individuals who certainly were not on the radar screen of the FBI. Uh, they weren't tripping any wires in terms of communication with known terrorist supporters, although some of that will be investigated here in the coming days. Um, and so it is frightening because they were running under the radar and they clearly were radicalized in a, in a way that uh, motivated them to attack fellow citizens, but not in a way that triggered any uh, markers or any defense mechanisms that we have built into the system. So one, if you're, if you're the FBI or in, in any intelligence, you know, how do you begin to guard against something like this? Well, Anthony, I think this is the reality of 21st century global terrorism. It's a much more diverse uh, environment, lots of different nationalities involved. And the reality is that the Islamic State and Al Qaeda before it has been trying to inspire these very types of attacks. They, they have been saying explicitly, you don't have to come fight with us to join the fight in the jihad. You can fight and use whatever means available to attack in place. And that, of course, raises the specter of these kinds of attacks and raises the difficulty of trying to ferret them out and prevent them before they happen. So the FBI has a major task on its hands. Juan Zarate in Washington. Thank you, Juan.